this episode is brought to you by Ubisoft's Anno 1800. Thanks to Ubisoft, you can try the game for free for a whole week starting now until December 18th. And it's up to 55% off the usual price and yours forever. If you like history, you'll love Anno 1800, the PC strategy game that lets you take charge of your fortune at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Prove your skills as a ruler by creating huge cities, planning efficient logistic networks, settling an exotic new continent, setting out expeditions around the globe, and dominating your opponents by diplomacy, trade, or warfare. How the world remembers your name is up to you. There are three DLCs, a co-op mode where you can build an empire together with up to four friends, multiplayer mode, a day-night cycle, dynamic weather, and the all-new stat system to help you manage your empire. The game is beloved by players who give it an 8.0 user score in line with its 81 Metacritic score. Remember, you can play Anno 1800 for free for a whole week starting now with a major sale during and following the free week so you can keep it forever. Try it for free now until December 18th and grab it on sale up to 55% off. Support Simple History and get the game by clicking the link in the description below. Sniper Dummies World War I During World War I, marksmanship was highly prized and both sides of the Great War started to field specialist sniper units. Snipers had to be excellent observers and skilled at concealment. They had to be able to predict what the enemy could see and what he could not. Snipers also had to be able to select a good position and have the patience to remain still for long periods of time. Many tricks were used to hide a sniper's position such as creeping out into no man's land late at night and remaining there under the cover of darkness, finding an elevated spot behind friendly lines, and creating armored loopholes in trench parapets. Camouflage was used on a vast scale for the first time in the First World War. The French and British would introduce camouflage sections in their armies. Those sections were responsible for concealment, hiding, trickery, deception, surprise, disruptive painting, mimicry, and the adaptation of camouflage found in nature. Camouflage sections needed painters, sculptors, architects, scene painters, carpenters, workers in iron, stage designers, and chemists to pull off their military deceptions. As well as dummy heads, sculptors used the same idea to make full-size human figures which may have been more successful in drawing out the attention of an enemy sniper, considering their size and realistic appearance. One trick by the Germans was to make a dummy of a wounded British soldier. The mannequin was dressed in a captured khaki uniform and the head was bound in bandages. They were placed in no man's land and a cord was used to raise the hand up and down. This was to encourage the enemy to attempt a rescue sending them into an easy killing zone. On the final night of the evacuation of Gallipoli, British and Australian troops left behind mannequins, tricking the Ottomans into thinking they were still there and buying the Allies more time. Another more simple variant of decoys were cardboard cutout soldiers. The British Army Camouflage School in Kensington were one of the centers where these kinds of decoys were designed. Even though they had less realistic appearance given their flattened shape, cardboard soldiers were still an effective way of deceiving an enemy. These life-size deceptions also took on other forms, which allowed the observer or sniper to hide inside to an oblivious enemy. Snipers used fake trees since no man's land was littered with tree stumps and blasted trunks. A suitable tree, such as one blasted by an explosion, was photographed or sketched and an artificial replica was created in order to replace the original tree. Under the cover of night, the real tree was replaced with its replica. Inside the fake tree was an observation or sniper post. Under the artist Solomon Joseph Solomon, the British developed fake trees inspired by earlier French designs. These were called OP trees or observation post trees. The artificial tree consisted of a steel tube that was 10 to 15 feet or 3 to 4.5 meters high, wrapped in canvas that had large sections and strips of tree bark sewed or glued on. The OP tree was wide enough for one soldier to climb up using internal rope ladders. Once he'd reached the top of the steel tube, there was a seat for him to sit on. The first OP tree was placed on March 12, 1916, on the front lines near Ypres. Afterwards, many fake trees were built in the same manner along the entire front line. 
the OP trees were used both for directing artillery fire or as sniper nests. The fake trees were usually installed among real trees neighboring it to make them more difficult for the enemy to spot them. When the Germans realized the trick, they started to build their own fake trees. Life-size animals were also created to fool the enemy, likened to a Trojan horse in ancient history. Horses had a big role in the First World War. They were part of cavalry charges and were the primary means of pulling ambulances on muddy ground, as well as transporting weapons, ammunition, and food supplies for all combatants. Large cavalry charges en masse were clearly outdated in the First World War. The result of these suicidal charges against the enemy machine gun defenses left no man's land littered with horse carcasses. So this choice of animal made an ideal, familiar shape to model a dummy out of. Instead of drawing out the enemy sniper, the role of the fake horse carcass was designed to prevent them from arousing suspicion in no man's land. Like fake trees, they worked as a form of camouflage that allowed an observer or sniper to spot targets extremely close to the enemy without being targeted themselves. French camoufleurs were painters choosing to practice camouflage. They came up with the creation during fighting near Creon on the Western Front. During the day, a horse had broke loose and ran across no man's land. When it reached near the German defenses, it was shot and fell to the ground. The French camouflage artists spotting this immediately saw an opportunity and began constructing a replica of the dead horse. Constructed from paper mache, the horse was modeled so that the head stretched way out on the ground and his legs pointed up in the air. Holes were drilled into the backside and the stomach so that the observer could see outside or poke his sniper rifle out. A big chunk was torn out of the body in the middle to look like an artillery shell had hit the horse on its side, but not all the way through the middle because this would not leave enough cover for the sniper. The design allowed the sniper to enter inside the replica and be fully concealed. Under the cover of darkness, the real horse carcass was taken away and the dummy replica was put in its place. This was done in the night because they would be instantly picked off by an enemy machine gun nest or a sniper in the daytime. The sniper crawled inside with plenty of ammunition and enough food to last a day. A telephone wire also ran from this horse dummy to the French trenches so that he could report on the German movements at an extremely close range. The snipers were able to change shifts because this ruse lasted three days. Being in the horse dummy was risky because enemy air reconnaissance flying above could notice what the human eye might miss. Once the photographs were developed and compared to the photos the day before, the Germans could spot differences in placement of the horse or may spot an extra horse carcass now there knowing there was no cavalry charge during the nighttime. These suspicions could attract attention towards the replica horse from the enemy who might spot an arm poking out. In one case, a German took a shot at the dead horse, either for target practice or because he was suspicious. This forced the French observer to get up and run back to his trenches, but as he did so, he was shot by a German. The value of creating concealed positions was clearly recognized, either in a fake animal or a replica tree. Sniping a high-value target like a visiting senior officer was worth the risk of exposing the sharpshooter's position. Using the same position repeatedly carried a great risk of detection or being counter-sniped. But towards the end of the First World War, the use of these life-size replica dummies to deceive the enemy at ground level became more and more challenging. Instead of only trying to deceive human sight, camoufleurs also had to deal with aerial photography, both in the immediate surroundings of no man's land and beyond it. <laughs>